Good afternoon to all. Uh, let me welcome all of you for the uh, pre conference workshop on stroke rehabilitation for clinicians uh, organized as a pre congress of the 134th anniversary international medical congress by the uh, expert committee on the rehabilitation of the sri lanka medical association uh, today is the third day of the program and uh, uh, we have scheduled five lectures i am uh, very thankful to all of you uh, took an interest to continue with the education program. And uh, meanwhile, I uh, need to mention that there is a fairly uh, comprehensive book that we have done on the subject with contributions from all the resource persons who uh, do Zoom lectures, as well as that who will be joining on the final day with the practical workshop. And that would be available for you, uh, not immediately, but we'll be able to give that uh, uh, access to the soft copy either today or tomorrow, uh, but much later we will be able to provide you with the hard copy of the uh, uh, publication. Uh, so today the lecture is done by Dr. Harsha Gunasekara, consultant neurologist from Sri Javadanapura Hospital, and he would be talking to us on stroke rehabilitation, how to do it. Uh, so over to you, uh, Dr. Harsha Gunasekara for the presentation. Thank you very much, Madam, for that kind words of introduction uh, and very good afternoon to all who have joined us uh, on this uh, series of webinars and uh, uh, to be followed up with the stroke rehabilitation workshop on stroke and nuclear for clinicians. So we have gone through two uh, talks, uh, started with uh, going through the burden of stroke care in the country and uh, Yesterday, we uh, had a talk on uh, principles of uh, stroke recovery uh, and rehabilitation. So today, my task is to take you through a practical approach uh, uh, on a stroke rehabilitation and how to do it. So uh, first, I'll just uh, go through the overview of my talk. So we'll just go through some evidence on stroke disability and outcomes, and also on what the evidence available on uh, rehabilitation interventions. Then what are the levels of uh, care in stroke rehabilitation? And what are the key approaches to stroke rehabilitation before we go through the uh, practical approach, uh, how to do it in a practical setting? So if you go through the uh, Evidence on stroke disability and outcomes. Uh, you can see here, uh, of course, we know worldwide stroke is the most common cause of uh, adult onset disability. And uh, 70 to 85 percent of first strokes are accompanied by uh, hemiparesis or hemiplegia. And if and studies have shown that only 60 percent of patients with the hemiparesis achieved functional uh, independence in simple ADL, so activities are daily living at six months with inpatient rehabilitation. So uh, this is a study which involved close to about 500 patients, uh, where they studied patients with different impairments. And uh, at six months, uh, they checked their recovery of being achieving a Barthel index of 90% or 90 or more. So the people who had only motor weakness had a much better rate of recovery as opposed to the people with motor impairment with additional impairments such as somatosensory impairment, hemianopias or mixed impairments. So the higher the number of impairments, the lower the chances of your uh, independence uh, at six months. So it's very important that uh, we initiate rehabilitation very early in these patients and do a very uh, intensive program and uh, ideally in a stroke unit care setting. So what are the evidence we have on intervention? So studies again are very limited in this area. Most of the studies have been done on long-term uh, 
rehabilitation, whereas acute rehabilitation interventions have been not studied widely and most are uh, small scale studies. Then there's another question on timing and in intensity of uh, acute rehabilitation still remains a controversy. So how much and how long uh, to do is a still a question. But on AHA guidelines, uh, what they say is stroke survivors should receive rehabilitation at an intensity commensurate with the anticipated benefit and tolerance. So that is very important. And what studies have shown is high dose, very early mobilization within 24 hours of stroke concept can reduce the odds of a favorable outcome uh, at three months and is not recommended. So mostly we have to see the patient's uh, capacity uh, and tailor the rehabilitation package to uh, fit the patient's ability to undergo active rehabilitation. What about the situation in Sri Lanka? I think uh, Senak Bansena went through this in a very uh, comprehensive way. So what we see here is the admissions we have seen over the last 10 years. Uh, to the hospitals with uh, strokes, which has almost doubled in number. So that's a good uh, positive uh, marker where we see that the patients are now uh, coming into hospital with uh, acute strokes. So they are aware that there's treatment for stroke and they are aware that the treatment should be initiated early to get a maximum benefit. So more patients have been coming uh, although there's increased number of admissions, there's no significant increase in the uh, stroke deaths. So the acute treatment has improved. So we need to uh, further improve uh, the rehabilitation care and the stroke clinic care. So how well are we equipped? Again, this was addressed uh, in uh, the earlier lecture. So I'm just going through the data from uh, 2019 annual health statistics. We have had about 60,000 missions to state hospitals with stroke, and that's the number of deaths. But if you take the stroke care facilities, uh, we are still uh, uh, with only uh, 382 general neurology beds and only 74 stroke beds uh, from a total of about 86,000 uh, state sector hospital beds. Uh, so, uh, so we need further improvements. There are challenges. Uh, particularly uh, at a time like this where all the resources are committed towards uh, combating the pandemic related issues. So uh, still we should be prepared to improve our facilities uh, for these patients who need uh, rehabilitation at a stroke unit. So th this is well known. What is organized stroke care? These are the three essentials in practice that we need to have. A dedicated stroke unit that is a geographically defined area admitting exclusively stroke patients. The second point is a multi professional team approach, also called like a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Uh, so, these, these uh, MDT teams should be focusing mainly on looking after the stroke unit patients, uh, dedicated to look, sorry, uh, dedicated to look after the stroke unit. Uh, admissions. And also we need a comprehensive stroke care pathway, uh, which includes a diagnostic workup, treatment, which should be seamlessly combined with the early mobilization, rehabilitation, and secondary prevention. So these are ideal settings that we should aim at achieving, uh, but there are so many challenges. As you know, in the state sector hospitals, there are shortage in uh, space for stroke in it. So we may have to use first dedicated stroke beds, but setting up a multi-professional team should be more feasible and setting up your own stroke care pathways. So what are the different levels of uh, care in stroke rehabilitation? So the ideal is the inpatient rehabilitation care where we can get the patient in acutely. Once the acute treatment is uh, completed, then we can initiate rehabilitation early. So in a stroke unit care. But some patients may not be uh, suitable for active acute rehabilitation. So they may be the primary focus of managing those patients will be more of a skilled nursing care. So there are skilled nursing care facilities in other countries. So uh, 
in our country, most of this will be done uh, in a medical ward. So these patients uh, will need more primary focus of the nursing care uh, issues. Then the next level is the outpatient care, which could be in a way of early supported discharge. These are the patients who have mild forms of disabilities where patients are stable enough for early discharge with a uh, outpatient rehabilitation program. Then in some patients, we may have to do chronic outpatient rehabilitation long term. And the third one is the community-based rehabilitation, which also needs uh, further development in our city. So what are the key approaches uh, to stroke rehabilitation? So whatever the disability or impairment, we need to go through these three uh, steps. The best would be restoration. That is, we retrain the CNS to engage in the impaired function, which is uh, affected by the injured brain's tissue. So that's the best option. Failing which it would be a compensation where you, we use adaptation through uh, use of devices or specific behaviors to perform the lost or impaired function. And finally, the modification where we are altering the patient's environment to promote uh, functions and the activities of daily living. So whatever the impairment or uh, disability, these three uh, uh, mechanisms will apply uh, in depending on the patient's severity of the disability. So how can we do it in a practical setting? So what I thought was to take you through these five steps. Uh, when you are setting up your own stroke unit, these are the essentials that you need to be uh, familiar with. So first step is establish your organized care setting, a stroke care setting. That's the first step in this uh, uh, practical approach. In assessing the patient's rehabilitation needs, it's a very important and uh, initial step uh, in uh, planning rehabilitation. Then the next is doing the interventions based on the rehabilitation goals, which have been uh, decided on by the MDT. Then very important that we do a periodic evaluation of progress of the patient uh, and responses, response of the patient to rehabilitation therapy. And finally, the discharge planning. Uh, it's very important, discharge doesn't end uh, care for the patient. So we need to have a transition of care in all these patients uh, from the hospital discharge to some outpatient uh, rehab setting and they also need uh, medical follow-up. So let's uh, go through uh, these steps uh, in detail. Uh, so establishing an organized care setting. So here we face a lot of challenges in our setup. So setting up a stroke unit uh, or a dedicated stroke bed. So there are a lot of guidelines on this. Uh, so you, in your own setup, if you are needing to give a uh, project proposal for a stroke unit, you may need to know roughly your bed strength that you require. So this you can, based on the admissions we have had. So generally what uh, the ESO advice is uh, uh, have, if you have 100 stroke admissions in the previous year, that equals to a, a single bed. So depending on your uh, stroke admissions, so if you have had 800 stroke admissions, your stroke units would, should have uh, eight beds uh, and so on. And you need to have at least four beds, 50% of your beds uh, should be acute monitoring because this is very important uh, if you're managing acute stroke patients, the, the acute monitoring bed should be available uh, for these patients. So then uh, diagnostic and therapeutic infrastructure discussion is beyond the scope of my talk. So please refer the guidelines uh, which will be also be given in the booklet that you will be refer, uh, referring. Uh, there are detailed guidelines uh, in uh, the minimum requirements for your diagnostic and therapeutic infrastructure you need. For example, uh, in imaging, in treatment, uh, thrombolysis, and all that. So here, the next step is the multidisciplinary care requirements. So what is most important is a multi-professional team must provide continuous daily services for these patients as needed tailored to the specific needs of the individual patients and availability with seven days a week. And also these MDT members should be trained 
they should be provided training all categories uh, on uh, the care of stroke patients uh, before they uh, plan on uh, doing rehabilitation uh, for the admissions in the unit. So what is the composition of the multidisciplinary team? So I'm not going to do the whole table here because these are all given in your guidelines. So very important since we are the doctors, the program is meant for the doctors. I just highlighted the role of the medical officer here. So, so we need a neurologist, a stroke patient and the medical officers. They will be the coordinators of this rehabilitation team. So ideally we should have two consultants so that there'll be a rotation among them. And also uh, depending on the bed strength and our required number of medical officers, uh, at least eight, on a 24 hour rotation. So they should coordinate the rehabilitation team. Uh, they should manage the stroke uh, and also the medical comorbidities. And they should lead and conduct at least two senior medical ward rounds per week and also weekly case monitors. So these are the guidelines issued with uh, the AHA, but uh, there are different sort of uh, guidelines from uh, different countries, but these are not hard and fast. So Main thing is that uh, you need to have your team uh, availability for the care of the patient uh, and also uh, uh, well organized other members in your MDT. So, uh, so the other members are the nursing officers, the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, speech and language pathologist, social worker, and the psychologist. So, I've given here the minimum card here if you need to sort of work out for your units. Uh, so there are different nursing cards for acute beds and the non-acute beds. Physiotherapists usually one per five beds is required on a seven day uh, rota. Occupation therapy same and the speech and language uh, one per 10 beds. So, and the social work and psychologist uh, as uh, the other categories. So this is the general uh, guideline that is given uh, in uh, most of the stroke care guidelines uh, for staff carders. So what are the criteria for admission to stroke clinics? So all acute admissions uh, to the stroke clinic should be arranged through the respective uh, emergency units of the hospital. So these mainly for the treatment, acute treatment purposes. But most acute patients should be accepted, uh, could be accepted from other units uh, upon a written formal referral by the respective consultants. So these will be mostly for uh, rehabilitation. Then patient admit, the, the important thing here is the patients admitted for rehabilitation should show capacity for a significant functional improvement expected to be achieved within a reasonable time period. So that's why I told like patients who need predominant nursing care will not benefit from a, ideally a stroke uh, unit care. So they will be more uh, better managed in a skilled nursing facility. So these patients should have uh, a scope for functional improvement to be achieved within a reasonable time period. So the next step is the rehabilitation assessment. So here the timing is again uh, uh, flexible, but earlier the better, depending on the patient's medical condition and the stability. So very important that we do at least within the 24 to 40, 40 hour period, with, depending on the patient's acute comorbidities. And here the medical officer should ensure timely written referrals to the relevant MDT members. So that's very important. Sometimes uh, the referrals are not written. So when you check with the physiotherapist, they haven't seen the patient. So these are sometimes we need to sort of uh, pay attention to and make sure that the relevant uh, members of the MDT is uh, addressed and referred the patient and also the nurses should be doing the coordination with the team to see whether the relevant MDT members have seen these uh, patients who have been referred. So the early assessment should be fo focused on the extent and severity of the disability. So we usually uh, uh, check the patient's uh, MRS, the modified ranking scale, extent of the limitation of the activities or daily living using the Barthel index and identification and prevention of post-stroke complications. So here, again, we 
recommend using uh, screening tools. I think you will be having a separate lecture on this uh, uh, at the end of this uh, lecture webinar series. So very important that we focus on these three aspect, uh, aspects when we do the initial rehabilitation assessment. So, uh, so I have highlighted here a few uh, important uh, post-stroke complications that we need screening for. Dysphagia, skin breakdown, blood and bowel dysfunction, deep vein thrombosis risk, nutritional deficiencies, depression and cognitive impairment. So, so, uh, so I think we will have a full talk on this uh, uh, at the fifth lecture of this uh, webinar series. Uh, so I'm not going to embark on in detail on this area at the moment. So the next important thing is setting of rehabilitation goals and interventions. So before planning interventions, we need to know what is the scope of this patient's ability and what are we aiming at uh, in uh, achieving a true rehabilitation. So it's very important. This is a collective function of the multidisciplinary team. So goal setting or goal planning is a cornerstone of effective stroke rehabilitation. So the goal setting should be patient-centered. That's very important that we uh, involve the patient here and done by the MDT usually at the initial case conference. So after the initial assessment, we can see how much this patient uh, can sort of improve depending on the disability. And uh, based on that, we could plan our interventions. So the benefits of this are it improves the patient's outcome. It enhances the patient's autonomy and also helps evaluation of outcomes. So what are the characteristics of these rehabilitation goals? So they should be specific. So um, very important that you uh, give uh, the real specific goals in these patients and they should be measurable so, so that you can assess the progress of the patient and also achievable rather than challenging. So it's very important that we concentrate on the lower order goals first, rather than giving the patients higher order goals and also realistic. So patients might want initially say to do higher order goal, but we need to sort of concentrate on the uh, realistic goals uh, rather than the patient's hopes and also time bound so that uh, we need to see whether these goals can be achieved uh, at a specific uh, time interval. So these are the smart characteristics which are usually given in most of these uh, guidelines. So initiate again with the short-term goals or the low order tasks, but this may not be always the patient's perspectives, but I think the MDT uh, should uh, take initiative here and make sure that the patient's uh, goals are uh, done uh, in a, uh, idealistic way. So the examples of the goals, what we usually uh, do in practice. So here we have given some examples, for example, improving the mobility of the patient. So here the, the specific goal is making the patient walk without support. So the responsibility mainly would be with the physiotherapist. For example, if it's improving hand function, we can suggest the patient to increase the use of left hand or improving in the skill in using his right hand if it's the right side of weakness. So uh, again, the occupational therapist plays the main role here. For example, if it's improving speech, improve functional communication, that's the most uh, initial uh, realistic goal we should achieve at, uh, improving patient's functional communication and also learn strategies to assist with word finding. So uh, in uh, aphasia, so, so here the uh, speech and language pathologist will be uh, the person involved. So again, I'm stressing the importance of uh, uh, managing initially with the low order goals, which are concrete, manageable, and lead to achievement of a next step of high order goals. So if you start at the other end, it will be a a difficult problem for you and you will probably not achieve the, re the real benefits from uh, the rehabilitation process. So, yeah, so what should be the focus on rehabilitation, uh, focus of rehabilitation intervention? So here we have the set of goals for each patient. So we 
plan our interventions to achieve these specific goals. So that's the main thing. Uh, also, at the same time, we need to identify the barriers of, uh, for rehabilitation uh, in individual patients, and then we have to make uh, adjustments to overcome them. And also, we should always do an evaluation of progress uh, of each patient as we go on. And also, we may need to modify the goals initially we have decided if it's necessary. So again, the rehabilitation interventions, uh, these are controversial here as I told, how much and how long. So should be initiated as early as feasible with the mobilization, that is the recommended thing. Intensity should be commensurate with the anticipated benefit and tolerance. Uh, so the recommendations for duration of therapy, again, it's quite uh, different with different uh, guidelines issued. Uh, so according to the British Association of stroke physicians guidelines. Individual therapy sessions of 45 minutes a day going up to seven days a week is recommended. Uh, but in the American Stroke Association guidelines, they uh, give a combined therapy session for all PT, OT, and SLT, that is physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and speech and language therapy, three hours uh, per day, uh, which also includes the PNO, that is prosthetic and orthotics, if it's necessary and at least for a period of five days a week. So it depends and uh, it, you may sort of uh, formulate your own uh, care plans for these patients. Uh, uh, so what are the common barriers to effective rehabilitation? Uh, so this is what we need to understand in all these patients. Uh, pain is the, one of the most common factors. So here we had to really identify the cause, underlying cause before treating these patients, uh, mostly with analgesics or the non-specific methods. So uh, one uh, problem here is uh, in most patients is post-stroke shoulder pain, which can uh, interfere with their rehabilitation and uh, reduce their motivation. Then spastis is another issue. It could cause both pain plus uh, re re reduction in their mobility. Then complex regional pain syndromes, very important to identify and treat. And also, uh, most of these patients are elderly, so they'll have uh, osteoarthritis of uh, the lower limb joints. So we need to address this in these patients, otherwise they would not comply with the uh, rehabilitation team. So depression and lack of mo uh, motivation is very important because most of these patients, if they are patients who are working in their working age group, they'll have issues with the loss of income and they'll be having some may be having loss of uh, social and family support so they may have a depression going on so we need to identify these uh, and uh, treat these patients then some patients may be having uh, social and economic factors lack of family support financial support so we need to get the social worker involved uh, involved here and uh, make sure that uh, these issues are addressed in these patients and also the untreated medical comorbidities, which could restrict uh, the patient's uh, uh, compl compliance with the rehabilitation process. So it's very important that we address these patients with cardiac comorbidities, especially, and also uh, pulmonary comorbidities. So coming into evaluation of progress. So here, this is what we do in our weekly case conferences. We should focus on our current care plans and outcomes. And we should always review our goals and we need to see whether the patient, how much the patient has achieved and whether we need to do a modification of these goals. If the patient has achieved a lower order goal, we can then set another higher order goal for the patient. So, or else if the patient is unable, we might even uh, uh, reduce the patient's uh, goals. So, also important to uh, address how we are going to overcome the barriers which have been identified uh, in these patients. So that is very important. Most of the time the uh, MDT team will come and tell you this patient is unable to bear weight when we mobilize or uh, the patient is in pain and so on. So, and also the spasticity which could affect their mobility. So these things should be discussed and uh, make sure that you do interventions to uh, enhance the uh, effectiveness of the rehabilitation process. Also, we think of the discharge planning in the patients uh, who are improving at this uh, uh, 
uh, evaluation of progress and we should discuss their follow-up care uh, uh, in, uh, in our weekly case conferences. So although each member of the team uh, makes a unique contribution, all are equally important in the team, nurses play a primary role in uh, communicating effectively with the, uh, all in, involved with the patients, the carers and the other members. And uh, they are the ones who collaborate the patients, individualized care needs. So it's a very important role that nurses play here. So coming on to discharge and transition of care. So uh, here, as I told, the discharge doesn't end the patient's care from hospital. So there are, so you need to always think of there's a continuum of care in these patients. So it may be a transition of care from hospital to home, which could be very challenging to both patients and caregivers. So as we know that most of, of our patients are discharged to a home setting where the family and the extended family are their carers. So we need to be uh, very uh, attentive to this and the patients uh, further rehab needs. So the discharge planning should focus both the patients and the caregiver. And most patients will be managed as I told in home care settings with the family members as carers. So a well-planned transition of care, identifying the interventions for long-term needs on the patients will reduce the length of hospital stay and a rate of readmission. So it is very important that you uh, don't take uh, hasty decisions in discharging these patients. So uh, it's very important that we address their transition of care and the, uh, further rehabilitation needs. So what are the levels of transition of care in these patients? So some patients may have milder degrees of disability where they have improved, they may need no not need any further rehabilitation and they may need just the medical follow-up. Some patients may need outpatient rehabilitation. This could be arranged hospital-based or you may refer the patient to a rehabilitation hospital for outpatient care. Uh, then community-based rehabilitation, uh, home rehabilitation. So some patients, if they can uh, afford uh, visiting a therapist uh, for home rehabilitation, they, uh, we can sometimes arrange this. Then long-term rehabilitation as an inpatient is sometimes required in patients with severe disabilities, so they may be admitted to a rehabilitation hospital uh, as we don't have any uh, intermediate care settings. Uh, uh, we mainly uh, use the rehabilitation hospitals wherever the facility is available. And also in some patients with severe disabilities, it will be a more of a skilled nursing care facility uh, in a long-term setting that would be required. So uh, what is the discharge planning checklist that you should go, uh, you should know? This is very important uh, before your discharge planning is done. So identify the long-term care needs, that's very important. So there's a collective role of the multidisciplinary team, uh, identifying the patient's long-term care needs. And other thing is very important that patients who need further rehabilitation, we, we should educate both the patient and the, train the caregiver. So, for example, the simplest thing would be a patient discharge on a nasogastric tube here. So, we should make sure that the person who is caring for the patient has been adequately trained uh, for uh, the nasogastric feeding. Then, advice on the changes to be done in the home environment is very important. So, these are usually the role of the occupational therapist. Then, advice on the use of equipment, mobility aids and adaptive aids. Usually the physiotherapist and occupational therapist deal with this. Then arranging further rehabilitation plans uh, to be continued as outpatient. So it is very important that you do the uh, necessary referrals for the uh, continuation of rehabilitation. And also uh, very important is the health education for secondary prevention. As we know that all out of all stroke uh, victims, uh, one in four have a, a chance of developing a recurrent stroke. So very important that they are given appropriate health education for secondary prevention, appropriate health education on maintaining compliance to treatment and also uh, continuing their follow-up, particularly in the times uh, like these where the patients are reluctant to come to hospital uh, settings and clinics. So it's very important that we give them adequate uh, advice. 
then advice on driving and return to work is very important. So most of the patients with uh, milder disabilities, we give them, uh, people who are employed, are given, uh, recommended to be given uh, adequate uh, medical leave uh, and uh, also uh, advise them on the safety at their workstations and uh, so on. Also, we need to address uh, for the patients uh, who are having financial problems, advice on the state-sponsored benefits through the divisional secretaries. So patients, uh, I think this was mentioned in Dr. Seneca's lecture as well. And there is a booklet uh, published by the uh, Stroke Association on these, giving uh, the available facilities, so the disability allowances, funds available for equipment, medications, and self-employment grants, and so on. So the social workers will be maintaining uh, uh, contact with the patients and uh, assessing their needs on, in this area. So effective discharge planning is very important uh, in these patients. So I think I have come to the last slide here. So I'm just summarizing these slide from the uh, ASA, uh, uh, showing the rehabilitation as a cycle, actually. It's not a, proce it's a process which continues. So Default is rehabilitation fall, so that's your default. And then you may select patients uh, who are exceptions to this, uh, patients with min minor disabilities. Uh, so then you decide on the patient's uh, category or the level of care need, whether it's inpatient or as outpatient, mostly the, as inpatient rehabilitation facility or a skilled nursing facility. Uh, we don't have a long-term care hospitals in this country. Uh, and these home health care services, but in our setup, it will be the stroke unit care and the rehab hospitals. Uh, so whatever the process, you need continu uh, continuous reassessment of the patient for a re-entry to the most appropriate rehabilitation op option or a setting or a facility. So that's very important. So patients may need further rehabilitation uh, uh, or readmission. So uh, it's very important that we uh, consider this as a continuous cycle in these patients. Uh, so I think I'll stop there and uh, open uh, this session for any questions if you have. Uh, I would also like you to invite uh, for the stroke conference we are going to plan, uh, which are actually planned for the last, to be held in May, which we had to postpone. So we are going ahead in, uh, in September 12th, actually, we have planned it. And also there is a workshop for the therapists and the nurses. If you, if you are, we have actually uh, circulated this again among the uh, audiences which were registered last time. And we invite you to uh, join. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for the uh, lecture. Uh, the, uh, I just want, would like to know if there are any questions. No, no. All right, Asha, thank you very much. As there are questions, uh, uh, we would be closing the session. I would like to remind the uh, uh, doctors uh, that our next lecture would be uh, uh, on uh, now today's. Uh, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 16th, on 16th at the same time. So we would be having two other lectures on 16th and 17th. And then 18th morning, we would be having the uh, uh, workshop. Uh, so uh, join uh, again on 16th at four, uh, sorry, at three for the same uh, series of lectures. Until then, thank you very much for joining and stay safe. Thank you, Harsha. Thank you very much.